be very great. And it seems really, too, to have deep roots in, in the American psyche. What do you think the basis for this is? Well, from my perspective, I think it's uh, been a kind of conditioned reflex that's been uh, building up in this country ever since the uh, Bolshevik Revolution in uh, Russia, 1917-1918. There may be some legitimate reasons why people object to communism, but I think the, the broad kind of fear that we have, in my view, is a, is a, is a conditioned reflex that sort of covers up what our own country's been up to during that period. It seems to me it's pretty obvious that the rationale of the American government for pushing through more and more money to buy weapons, you know, the influence on Congress is the, quote, fear, military fear of the Soviet Union. Actually, there are two, as far as I can see, there are two forces in the world that uh, are attempting to uh, carry out the, in my view, quite ludicrous attempt to identify the Soviet Union with communism. One is the Soviet leadership itself, which is trying to exploit the uh, uh, the positive image of the uh, uh, of the egalitarian communist tradition for their own benefit, and the other is the United States, the American propaganda system, which is uh, which also would like to undermine that egalitarian vision by associating it with Russian totalitarianism. But I don't think that we should. And, and, and you're right. I mean, this leads to a situation in which the values of uh, the egalitarian socialist tradition, the libertarian, egalitarian socialist tradition, are associated in the American mind with the brutal and repressive Soviet state, which in my view has nothing whatsoever to do with communism or anything, to, no connection with it. And these things, I think, very much should be dissociated. So I wouldn't think that, uh, uh, I, I don't, I, I, for example, I think the American people have very good reason, or everyone has good reason, to fear the Russian state, which is a violent and repressive and brutal autocracy. So I don't know that we should spend our time trying to argue about the definition. I would agree with Noam in, in a pure sense, but I think in practical political terms, there still is seen as a threat of Soviet communism in terms of American military and foreign policy. Yeah, you're right, but I think we have to separate out the various strands in that threat. Uh, it's perfectly true that the United States, uh, or at least you know, the American leadership and the American ideological system, have been very strongly opposed to what they call socialism. Uh, but, of course, they're opposed to many other things, too. For example, they've often been opposed to fascism. You know, we went to war with fascist states. They're, they were opposed to national capitalism in Europe. I mean, they were opposed, the United States has been opposed to democracy. For example, we were opposed to democracy to a New Deal-style re regime in Guatemala. And, in fact, there's a general principle of which the opposition to so-called so socialism is just one special case. Namely, the United States is opposed, naturally, to any attempt on the part of any society to use its resources for its own purposes instead of to integrate itself into uh, what we call an open world system, which means a system that's open to American economic penetration and political control. If any society deviates from that, whether it's capitalist, fascist, communist, uh, you know, democratic or whatever, the United States will be opposed to it. It's very handy to use the quote Soviet threat or the phrase communist threat to cover up the efforts to protect American hegemony everywhere in the world. We had our, we got some 2,000 bases all around the world. The Russians have nothing like that. If you came down from Mars, it would be our country would be seen as the expanding power. But the American mindset is just the opposite of that. We see the Soviet Union; they're the threat out there, and we're sort of just minding our own business. We've brought up now a, num a number of times uh, uh, the question of. Uh, uh, life in the Soviet Union, repressive society, various uh, words have been used to, to describe it. Uh, is this a given? In other words, are we all in agreement that the Soviet Union is a very repressive society? Dissent is totally stifled. Uh, it's authoritarian, totalitarian, absolutely no freedoms you know, in that society. Is, is that an accurate well, I, perception? I, I don't think it's... Uh, it, it's it's a very difficult kind of question. If you're an ordinary worker, and you know, then then things may not be quite so bad. Uh, uh, but if you try to go beyond that, and you run into a bureaucracy, you will run into all kinds of constraints on what you can do. If you're prepared just to be an ordinary John Doe and not cause too many problems, you may be all right. Uh, what, because one of the things the Russians do do, which which uh, is important to them, is to say there are a different set of rights in their country. Well, it's a question of medical rights, whether the treatment is good or bad, 
it has to be judged differently. But at least they, they espouse that. They say full employment. Uh, right. Now, of course, there are some people who are unemployed. If you're a dissident, you can be unemployed. And then there's no unemployment compensation because by definition, there's no unemployment. So what do you need unemployment compensation for? So for you, that can be bad. So in those areas, the Russians indeed are kind of, there's like a social contract which says, we'll take care of your elemental economic needs. Now, we don't do that too well in this country. And in, you know, one of the biggest strains that Russians keep throwing up to me is, how can such a rich country like the United States tolerate unemployment? And that's a hard, that's not an easy question to answer, if there's an answer at all. Uh, but when you go beyond that, I mean, the Russian system is a very strict one, and you're not allowed much deviation. And if you, if you want to step out of line, you're going to find that it's, you're subject to all kinds of, of pressure, uh, possibly uh, uh, jailing. It's not to say that things are free in this country, but, but in the Soviet Union, there's much, much greater fear. If you go to visit somebody's home and they don't have authorization before, you walk in, you don't talk because they're feared that somebody will hear you speaking English or Russian with an accent. Uh, it, it's, it's a very frightening kind of thing. So, I mean, that, that, mm -hmm. that, that is a problem that exists and is Let's real. Let's say uh, that, uh, that every one of these criticisms has some validity. Uh, from my perspective, the uh, nuclear arms race is just going to make matters worse. I mean, I think there's, there's historical reason for the Soviet Union to be fearful of mm. the West. There was, as I said earlier, there was the counter-revolution in the beginning, then there was a whole period when we had the atom bomb, they didn't have it, and they felt they were being intimidated. You know, a whole series of incidents where there is this fear of the West, and I would say that uh, there could perhaps be a solidarity movement, as in Poland, in the Soviet Union in 15 years if we had genuine coexistence in detente because I imagine Soviet workers like Polish workers you know are sort of fed up with the top-down stuff so I I don't know that we need to argue uh, in basically that things are most Americans would not like to live in the Soviet Union and let me you're a black teenager in Detroit out of work you know it might look pretty good to be in a place where there's no unemployment and you can go to school without joining the army and so forth but be that as it may I would say that that uh, that what the problem we've run into is the Soviet Union has been on the defensive, that the repression, the possibility of intervention along its frontier, all of that is aggravated by the American initiatives in, in keeping the arms race going. Because it seems to me the initiative of the arms race has come from the West from the beginning and continues to come from the West. And Mr. Reagan criticizes the Soviet Union for all perhaps the good reasons, but his policies, in my view, are almost calculated to, to reinforce and aggravate and make the situation worse. Well, I think Russ has made, uh, has distinguished things properly that ought to be distinguished. On the one hand, there's the question of what kind of a society the Soviet Union is. And I think we would, I, I doubt if either of us would disagree in any serious way with what Marshall just said. You know, it's a highly repressive society which has a kind of social contract that puts a floor under certain kinds of suffering. Okay, that's the kind of society it is. Separate question is what kind of a threat it poses. Those are se very entirely separate questions. I mean, you could have the most brutal, murderous society internally, which just wouldn't happen to be a threat out outside. You could have the freest. It's in fact through history there has been no correlation between that I can detect between the internal freedom of a society and its violence and aggression abroad. For example, England was the freest country in the world in the 19th century. And in India, it acted like the Nazis did. You know, the United States is, the, in my view, the most open, politically speaking, forgetting social issues and so on. It's the most open and freest society in the world. And it also has the most brutal record of violence and aggression in the world. Now, these things are just uncorrelated. Now, if you look at the Soviet Union, it seems to me, yes, it is a repressive and, uh, you know, dissent is suppressed. And it's, in my view, it's a dungeon. It's kind of a dungeon with a certain degree of social services. Now, uh, and it, it is also a threat. It's a threat to its, the government. It's a threat to its own population. It's a threat to, in fact, anyone within its reach. But its reach doesn't happen to be very 